In today's video I have this pair of Philips portable televisions, both 10 inch ones, these are the same model. Now these actually came out in two different models, these are a kind of goldy coloured one. They made a silver version before these, they're all made by Sharp in Japan. The others were a KA910 as a model number, and these are a KA920, 920. And pretty much identical inside I think, but they changed the connectors on the back of these. This one thankfully comes with just a standard figure eight cord and a little DC connection there for the 12 volt because these are AC-DC sets. And the, the previous one, for some reason, some of the earlier TVs, I don't know if they couldn't do it safely or they're worried about voltage coming out of those pins or what the story was, but they made them with like big sort of rectangular five pin plugs that were interchangeable. You had to have one cord on it for 240 volts and a separate cord for 12. And the main reason they were a pain, those ones, is because people always lost the 12 volt ones. You'd get these TVs, particularly second hand, and they'd never have the 12 volt cord with them, and it was you couldn't really make one to fit it. So that was a bit of a pain, but they're quite a nice little TV, very reliable. About 90% of the problem you saw with these was someone had dropped it and busted the tube. They seem to break quite easily, they're only a thin neck tube in them. And I guess if you just drop that straight down, the neck board snaps it off. So I had at one stage, I had, I think, four or five of these with busted tubes in them. And of course, it was only these. And there is a like radio cassette player 10-inch TV from Sharp. don't think they ever came out on the Philips brand. But there is a model like that, which has should have the same tube in these. I've never actually seen inside one, so I don't know for sure, but I reckon it would. And I think the only time I was actually down the rubbish dump once and miraculously down the side of the, the bank of the tip, I saw a tube that looked about this size just sitting there on the ground. Someone either chucked it down the bank or it got pushed down there by the dozer or something and it was still intact. It had no yoke, no magnet assembly on it. But I put it in one of the sets I had with a busted tube and it fixed it perfectly. And yeah, these were worth a couple hundred dollars second hand, these back in the 90s sort of thing, because they were sort of very expensive new. I'm not sure what these ones actually cost new. Could have been up towards a thousand dollars or something for these ones. At that time in the 90s, you could only get these, I think they were Chinese or Korean ones, rebadged as Akai at first. And then I think they might have actually changed the design. There was a later one that came out under Masuda and Akai and all sorts of stuff. I think Tandy sold them. And they were pretty horrible TV. They had these voltage regulators and some of them that failed. Sort of a, a potted block in there and someone did make a little switch mode power supply thing to replace them. But they, everything used to fail on those things. They were very cheapo parts. Whereas these, like I say, almost 100% reliable. I can't actually remember fixing a fault in one of these that wasn't just a busted tube. Though I do get a feeling I may have fixed one or two over the years, but I honestly can't remember what for. Again, could have been damage, corrosion, something that someone did to it, rather than a failing, but they were super reliable. All these little small Japanese TVs, the smaller they were, normally the more reliable they were, because there's no high currents, no, not much heat. So very reliable. These ones have just got this natural 24 AC-DC portable on the top. We've got some tuning up here. I think this actually was the other thing. God, that's dirty in there. This thing has been in the shed a long time and it was probably filthy before I even got it. I forget where one of these came from. The other one I think came from a tip shop. I saw it for five dollars or something and couldn't resist grabbing it. But where I ended up with the second one from I failed to remember. But I think the earlier version had a really good tuning, digit electronic tuning system. And it was one of the quickest electronic tuners I've ever seen. I think you just press the buttons. I seem to remember three buttons in there. I'm not sure if they were for each band. But they'd come up with a little on-screen display and it would just whip across the screen, find any channels really quick. I don't know why the modern TVs couldn't do that, but I think, yeah, these ones went back to a, a manual type tuning. I mean, they've got the up-down buttons, but they've got a, a separate preset for each one. I think the earlier model didn't have that. Some of the Philips were actually the fastest electronic tuners out there. They were just brilliant because when you're fixing things all the time and having to tune channels in, you get very sick of waiting for things to take half an hour to tune a few channels in, which some of them literally seem <laughs> to take that long. But these these were a good little system, but that's even better in some ways. You can quickly just use your thumb wheels. You've got your three band switch position and a little white switch and the little thumb wheel you just turn, turn your automatic fine tuning off. And away you go, we've got brightness, contrast and co colour under there. A couple of build-on antennas, which plug in via this little ballon on the back. Just a fly lead hanging out the back. 
and a tuner. No AVs or anything, unfortunately. That's your vertical hold. So they and they are a live chassis and these things, even though it's got the 12 volt connection, I'm pretty sure this is largely, yes, yeah, is chassis live. Contacting is dangerous. I think this goes through a separate inverter power supply that's kind of isolated, but the mains part of it is pretty well live. I think, I think there is an isolated socket on the back. It might even be a standard Phillips, although this one looks like a, just a metal tuner sticking out the back. So who knows, maybe they're not totally telling the truth on that. I'm pretty sure the other model was a definite live chassis, but it might be one of these partially isolated things, so it's not technically a live chassis, but I'm not sure that anyone would want to bother modding one of these or anything. And that one's probably a bit cleaner, that's still full of dust. But generally looks to be in good condition. This one's pretty rough. Paint scrapes and stuff, part of the Phillips badge has been worn off. I reckon this one's been used Transported around in a caravan or a car or something a lot. It's definitely had a hard life So that's usually a sign and we've got red paint and stuff on it So it might have been jammed in a caravan or moved around and that's why they eventually got broken a lot of them because People tripped over or fell down the steps getting out of the caravan or something and Moving it around or in the vehicle it, it tipped over or something They forgot to put it away and it fell off the bench in the caravan or who knows what happened, but they did get broken a bit I guess we can plug this one, still got the cord on it, I think just the standard figure eight type power cord, whether that's the original one or not, I don't know, but yeah, it's a fairly well insulated one. Hirakagawa. Hirak. Hirakawa. So that's a Japanese one, this probably is an import. What we got on the back? Phillips, warring, dangerous voltage, chassis live. Yeah, remove the plugs before. Taking the back off, KA920. Manufacturer's specifications of Philips Consumer Products of Australia, made in Japan. And I did see a picture somewhere of one of these, New Zealand, I think, kept their tariffs on their imports of televisions and stuff a lot longer than Australia did. And I think there was an actual Pi brand in one of these. I'm not sure if it's this one or the KA910, but there was a Pi brand in one that was supposedly, you know, they pretended to assemble some of it in New Zealand, I guess. Probably sent it all over in boxes and screwed the front and back covers on or something. Just to have some local content. Let's see if this thing works. I'd be surprised if it doesn't. And I can't remember if the other one had a different channel display. This one's got the standard sort of Phillips thing. Actually this one, oh does it come out? Often Phillips sometimes had a way to remove the little plastic card in there and you could change what channels it showed because this has got two, zero, seven, nine, ten. So it's the mainland channels basically. ABC zero is probably for is what did we have a ten as well? No, we've got ten, so we've got ten, nine, seven, the commercial. Zero is probably if you want to put a VCR or something on it. A couple of stars, which is just for whatever. And U was usually for SBS for the UHF. But yeah, very nice little picture on them. These little compact tubes generally gave a very good picture. We better hook it up to some sort of signal source, I guess. Got a headphone socket on the back again. That suggests it's not necessarily a live chassis, this thing. Some white stuff there, but we'll take the back off and have a look in a minute as well. Okay, I'll have to tune this in. I don't think we need to worry about upsetting the tuning. Normally you try not to mess up the customer's tuning, of course, when you had it set to repair, but... I'm still in the habit of thinking, well, I don't want to miss channel two. They've probably got the ABC on it, but you know, have we got any color adjustment here? Or is my eyes on grayscale? See somewhere. I want to AFT off. And Controls not the best of I think. Give us some contrast. Way too much colour saturation, a little bit of interference there, but that's probably as good as we're gonna get. And my pattern generator is still doing weird stuff. But should give a pretty good picture. Yeah, that's all pretty good. There's a little bit of convergence out there, a little bit of red. I mean, that was generally acceptable for a TV like this anyway, but in a perfect world, it'd be a little bit better than that. 
That looks pretty good. I think that pot could do with a clean. I don't know if you can get to them from the front. Maybe you can. Some of them were angled up inside there a bit. Took a little bit of lube out of it, so it feels a little bit rougher than it was, but I think that's pretty good now. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. This one's got a nice pair of antennas on it, hardly any scratches. This one probably sat most of its life in a cupboard or in a box or something. Strangely, people would buy things like this, even though they're very expensive, and then just sort of sit them around and not use them much. Maybe they just never got around to doing whatever they plan to use it for. Sometimes they make a good little kitchen television or something. And yeah, like I say, some of this stuff just ended up sitting in cupboards for 20 years until they got rid of it. Now this looks kind of like one that might have, because most of these did have scratches and scrapes and stuff on them if anyone used them for what they were intended to be used for. They certainly went out on road trips and stuff. Big problem with these is they did pull an awful amount of current too. I think you're looking around four or five amps, maybe more with some of these little sets. So they suck your battery dry pretty quick. Did I have to take that off? I can never remember where that bit, whether we need to take it off or not. Or it just falls off inside afterwards. That's oh, beautiful and clean in there too. A little bit of dust on the bottom, but you know this I think this model is an isolated yeah well the tuner tuner sticks out the back so that puts a lie to it being a live chassis I think where's the headphone the headphone must be well that's the speaker I guess the headphone is probably hooked to that there's no transformer on it that I can see shows an isolated power supply does go into a couple of pins in the line output but that counts as isolated I think there's your chopper transformer so this one is basically an isolated chassis, I think. You might want to double check that, but this should be possible if you could actually put an AV input potentially into it. This is so old, it's still got a TA3 metal transistor for the horizontal output. I don't actually know when these came out, but I think it's kind of early 80s, maybe 82 to 84 or something. It's somewhere in there from memory. Do we have any dates on anything? It's got a 270 ACB22 tube in it. Black stripe. So is it, an, I think some of these sharps, they've got the same sort of red labels. They might've just been an actual, yeah, made by Toshiba Japan. So they just put a big sharp badge on there, I guess to fool people if they looked inside. But the fine print says made by Toshiba Japan. The label looks very much like a Toshiba label. And if it's got black stripe, I think, Black Stripe was technically their patented term or whatever, their trademark. It says UK Patent or TM, though any tube was sort of black. The Japanese, I think, pretty much invented putting black mark, uh, like a black mask over the phosphor so that it separated all the little like phosphor dots. They're not really pixels, but the dots. And it gives a higher contrast picture because then the color can't sort of or the light can't bleed from one to the other so first you've got your convergence to try and land the dot on the right place or the electron beam on the right dot and then if you put this mask around it definitely looks better the old phillips canines and stuff from the mid 70s were didn't have any of that and they they showed the pictures were never as good as the japanese sets even though they weren't too bad when they were new but if you really looked at them you could see the difference I guess for the average person probably didn't matter, but I think Phillips almost to the sort of 78, 79 before they actually started putting that striping on their tubes. So with a little tiny thin neck tube, little tiny yoke, relatively low power compared to even a 34 centimeter. I think this is our inverter board here. So that takes your 12 volts in and converts it up to higher voltages to run all the horizontal and stuff and this is why it draws quite a lot of power that's reasonably in inefficient a bit better than some of the earlier tech but it still wastes a bit of power looks like your 
chopper transistor there so it's like a little switch mode power supply in itself but this one inverts upwards rather than downwards so you take your 12 volt in and it yeah, looks like so it's probably 110 volts I guess to run the horizontal as well as various other rails where does he actually you can't see on this one oh yeah we've got some we've got these two wires here I think they're the mains wiring looks like they just go to the mains power switch board and stuff I don't know if you have a power switch on the 12 volt. Yeah, this is a 12 volt. These purple ones here, they come straight into that plug on that board. And we've got a fuse. 5 amp fuse, so it must draw a little bit less than that. I think I see... Is this a Zener diode to ground? So, that's a, well, it's at least a backwards diode. So if you hook the polarity up wrong, it'll just blow the fuse, because it'll basically short the, the power across there, blowing the fuse because it's across the filter cap which is on the secondary of the fuse so if positive comes in on the negative it just flows straight through that diode to the fuse and it's just like a big short circuit through the diode and blows the fuse so a good protection device I said some of the CB radios they'd put an 18 volt zener in there as well which is an extra protection if someone plugged it into a 24 volt truck or something I don't think they bothered in most of these things just reverse polarity but that's something to look for if you find one with a blown fuse sometimes that diode will be shorted out or something if someone's hooked it up backwards which people did from time to time if you give people the opportunity to hook something up wrong they always seem to do it sooner or later so there's a certain number of people get something hooked up badly somewhere and I assume this came out with a lead maybe with a couple of alligator clips on it or something the original lead but once they lost that they could be hooking anything up and fiddling around as people do and so that was a good thing to have otherwise you put the wrong polarity into that switch mode and blow the chopper transistor and who knows what else chances are it wouldn't go any further than that but it's possible it could do further damage to the set but pretty unlikely and there's not a lot else of real interest in here Just got a little slide up chassis here which just got to be careful what you're pulling on what is holding it there's a degaussing coil with all this wiring here so you've got to undo that little clip there's your rgb drives on the back of the tube focus and screen usual thing and your plastic cover over the power supply there to keep it isolated even more I guess so no one puts their finger in there maybe but that tuner goes straight out the antenna socket so we can say that's definitely not live chassis really because there's no way they could do that I get a feeling the other model did have and I think that's partly why they wanted all this isolated so the, the plug that you pulled out each time when there was a, either a 12 volt or 240 volt plug plugged in it would cover everything up all the pins about five of them I think they had Whereas this one, you've got either that socket open when the mains plugs in, or if you've got the 12 volt in, you've got those two pins open, which technically, in most switch modes and stuff, there's no way it can get back, because again, the switch mode's isolated from the secondary, because we're feeding through this other power supply into the B+, plus to run the horizontal and stuff, so that can go back, but there's diodes blocking it. Our little transformer here says diodes because they're, they're all rectified plus you've got this transformer isolating it and every other part isolated so there's no way you can get a voltage feedback but I think that's what they were scared of there was a GE what was it a, no, a general Fujitsu general 12 inch portable which also had a large five pin or six pin connector on it with interchangeable power cords and I think I've got a Hitachi here so it might be the same those weird little rectangular very similar shape to this actually little Hitachi portables and they I think they had the speaker on the side this one's actually got a front mounted speaker so that's something it's only a little tiny one even an LCD TV just about put that one to shame a little tiny thing but they did sound okay for their size at least it's front facing which is better than some of the LCDs and stuff but yeah some I think the Hitachi here does have a interchangeable power cord if it is the 12 volt one it's one of the next ones that was actually sitting under this one so i'll have to get that out and we'll have a look but i don't think there's much point really doing much more with that i think that's just your standard 2.1 type plug so there's nothing much there we can try on for the outside i guess i should hook it up 
and see, or actually one thing I want to do, does it tell you on this one, were they generous enough to actually tell you what the polarity is? No, so they just tell you DC 12 volts, typical. So inevitably you end up having to pull it to bits because you don't know if it's positive tip or negative tip. So I guess we should have a look at that. Easy enough because this circuit board's marked. We know it comes in on that purple plug there. That side of it goes to the negative of this capacitor. That side goes through the fuse. We've got the diode pointing backwards, basically up towards the positive. So it won't take long to do a continuity test from that middle pin. If I can touch it. And it's positive tip. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's less than I thought, it's about two and a half amps. Well, it's starting to go up. I guess once the beam current gets going, so it's sitting on pretty much three amps. So it's less than I thought. I actually thought maybe those other cheapo ones, the Masudas and Akai's and stuff, use more than these. These are actually possibly a little bit more efficient. I'm not sure they'll think this might have. I don't know if the degaussing works in these or not. The other ones used to have a button, I think, to press to actually manually operate it if you wanted to use it. But yeah, three amps is actually quite reasonable, so these probably build a bit more efficient. I'm sure those Masudas were up around the four or five amp. I remember a guy had trouble using one in his caravan, and they were very picky about the voltage too, if it dropped much, and the wiring in his caravan wasn't really up to it. And that's purely off the 12 volts. If I can move this without shortening anything out. We're just running off that little plug in the back. Oh, I'm impressed with that. I actually don't know if I ever really use these on 12 volts. Other than just, I would just test them if I had one for sale or something. And maybe if I had one in for repair, you'd normally just at least plug it in and make sure it looked like it was running. Because you guarantee if you send it back to the customer without it running, even though they had the fault for years, they'd complain about it. So, always worth checking every last little thing with them. Okay, let's see if this other one runs. Ooh, not quite as good as a little greeny when it starts up, but it's getting there in the end. Oh, we've got vertical hold issue. Ah, as soon as I touched that, that came right. That's a bad sign. I wonder if I've got a dicky vertical hold control or a dry joint. It doesn't seem to... Uh, did flick a little bit then, so maybe that's not 100%. So this one's basically running other than a slightly dodgy... DC plug on it and it could even be because I've got the wrong size on there It seemed to work alright on the other one but sometimes the center hole in those plugs is the wrong size there's two different ones you can get or it could just be a bit of corrosion but this TV's fairly dirty and horrible anyway and it's much better now that you can replace these with just an LCD probably with a DVD player built in and it uses quite a bit less power weighs a lot less takes up a lot less room not sure what that actually weighs, but you could probably get a bit of a workout to it using these things. They're not too bad, but they're still reasonably heavy. But quite a cool little TV in their day. I still kind of like the look of them. I like, for some reason, I like a lot of these smaller colour TVs. They were something a bit more special. And I'm not sure how many years they sold them for. Maybe early 80s to mid 80s or somewhere around there but they did sell a lot of these i think in australia this was the only tv you could get this size basically in a 12 volt portable type version i don't think there were any other 10 inches available at the time there were all the little five inches like the other one i looked at that little jvc thing and stuff but i think as far as 10 inches it was just these for a while and it probably wasn't that many years and Sharp, like I say, did make one, but it wasn't 12 volt, it wasn't portable, I don't think. It was just a, a, a thing, a larger box, flatter front, and I think it had a tape deck and a radio or something over this side, rather than just the, the TV functions, and I think it was quite a bit higher. And of course, these tubes go quite a way back, so they've got to be quite a big box. That was always a limitation with these tubes, is the neck length. One of the reasons they didn't use them and why most boom boxes and stuff with TVs in them have black and white because the colour ones were just too far back. You'd end up with a boom box that's you know so deep 
even those little that little JVC five inch one I looked at probably comes back to here somewhere. It's not much better than this one. The tube neck certainly goes back a long way on colour. And of course there were plenty, you could just buy your Kmart $99 or whatever it was, black and white, 12 inch portable TV. They sold thousands and thousands of those. A lot more than these things of course. And a lot of people were just happy if they're camping or whatever, if they could just have a slightly bigger screen and in black and white was good enough. At least you know you had sound, you had picture, it was good enough to get you by. Having a, a colour one was a bit of a luxury, but of course they're a bit smaller. And these probably use, you know, five times the power or something. Those little black and whites were quite efficient, I think. So they were not very greedy on power. There's a lot more electronics in this. Obviously you've got sort of three times the guns in the picture tube and that sort of thing. Much higher voltage on the tube. So overall a lot less efficient. But they were a cool little TV in their time. I'm glad I still have a couple around. I would like to get the other model as well. It would have been nice if I got one 910 and one 920, but if any of these I could get back in the day, I could sell out the door as quick as I could get them. Um, they were a very good seller, these little TVs. There's always someone after one, and people didn't want to spend six, seven hundred dollars on one. If they get one second hand for a couple hundred dollars, much better. But that's that one done for now, so thanks for watching.